stacking interviews. We got Tucker Davidson during Cardinals week. The Braves left-hander was an awesome conversation. Now we come full circle to our very first guest on the Just Baseball Show. Katie Wu is the Cardinals writer for The Athletic. I guess now she kind of writes for the New York Times, too. How about that buyout? That was massive. The Athletic, $550 million, their valuation bought by the New York Times earlier today. $550 million, huh? And they say that the newspaper is dead, and yet the New York Times... $550 $550 million for the athletic. Well, so the thing with the thing with print media and when the athletics started, I remember I was one of the early subscribers to the athletic because they immediately snatched up some of my favorite writers. And a lot of them were in the college basketball space. Like Dana mm-hmm. O'Neill was a very quick mover on the athletic. And I said, I got to read her stuff. And then the baseball writers started to just pile up and pile up and pile oh, up. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I got to do this. And the knock on the athletic was always, why is anybody going to pay for that when you get, you know, free journalism there? I was like, I'm going to pay because I like the content that they put out. Yeah, Like that's the best content out there and they're being valued as such. And Ken Rosenthal was a guy who is currently one of the big baseball writers for the athletic. So even though MLB network fired him due to the Rob Manfred stuff, which is just straight up stupid, stupid, but we're going to see a lot more of Ken Rosenthal still on the athletic and that's where I absorb him because I'm not a big MLB network watcher because I'd rather talk and listen about teams about moves about free agency stuff than watching an old baseball movie for six straight days (laughs) or watching me though yeah or watching 2012 game four of the world series on a Tuesday at 2 p.m that's just not really my vibe Yeah, it's not my vibe either. And, you know, they've got Jason Stark, who's a stone cold killer in the baseball space. Uh, Also, you know, I I mentioned the college basketball stuff. I've got a good friend in Matt Gutierrez, who writes NFL stuff now, covered Syracuse basketball for for a while for the athletic. I mean, they have this insane Rolodex of quality writers. And if you don't subscribe to the athletic, go subscribe, go read Katie's stuff. But before we get into Katie Wu, uh, it was nine degrees last night in Chicago. The wind chill brought the real field down to negative 15 at one point. What the fuck are we doing not living in like Florida? Should we go to Florida? Because it's 32 in New York City right now. Um, but it's been funny. The, the global warming has definitely taken an effect on the rest of the globe because this is the coldest coldest it's been in a while and when i was here in december it was 58 and usually it should be snowing by now and there's no snow on the ground it's just a little bit cold but at least at some parts of the country it's actually cold so like it's right now if i check the apple watch it's 16 degrees just outside chicago and the wind chill has it right around like eight or nine degrees um and there's snow on the ground but there wasn't snow on the ground at any moment before christmas so make up your mind like if you're gonna be cold and shitty do it by like december 10th so there can be snow on the ground for christmas i agree you know what i'm just thinking about i'm i just want to ask her about tony kemp i want to ask katie Wu about tony kemp and i want to prove to her why he should be a valuable piece of the st louis cardinals moving forward and i know now's your chance make fun of me now's Now's your chance. chance here's katie Wu. Katie Wu is the Cardinals beat writer for the Athletics. She just finished up her first season covering the club. That included a 17-game win streak that propelled them firmly into the playoff picture. The first chapter in Nolan Arenado's career in St. Louis and Adam Wainwright never coming off the mound at the ripe age of 74. But uh, (laughs) I think it included a move, too, for you, Katie. When you were the first guest on the Just Baseball show, you were living out of a hotel uh, for a couple weeks in St. Louis. I assume a change of scenery now. I forgot that I was living in a hotel when uh, when we did that. So good good memories. Thank you for bringing that back. Um, <laughs> yes, a change of scenery. I'm actually not in St. Louis right now. I came back to California for the holidays. We'll go back. Uh, I'll go back like next week. But it's snowing there, so maybe I won't. Um, we'll we'll see though. But yes, no longer living in a hotel, have an apartment. You know, the bare minimums to being a, a functioning adult society. I have checked those boxes. That's so great. Good stuff. Hey, if anyone hasn't read Katie's recap of her first season as an MLB beat writer on The Athletic, I just recommend doing so. That came out about a week ago. We'll link it in the episode description. Things move almost too quickly, and it's hard to keep your ducks in a row when you're constantly on the move, 
which resonated with someone who's constantly like on a bus or a plane, like you were in the back half of this year, especially when some of the precautions lifted. But when that moment came for you, Katie, when even if it was fleeting, where you said, I'm doing this thing and, and I'm kicking ass doing so, like, what did that feel like for you in year one? Real. I don't know if there was a, a time where it really clicked. It, it just, you, you go through the motions each day and, you know, there's 162 games and it, it never stops. It's, it just very much becomes part of your routine. So I don't know if there was like a big, like, click moment for me. Um, but I can recall sitting at Wrigley Field in the middle of September after the Cardinals pulled off, like, the, the most ridiculous, absurd double play and won their 15th game. I'm looking around and at this time I'm a deadline writer and you know at the athletic you know we don't usually write on too much of a deadline but when they win so many games you're essentially on a deadline I'm looking around and the three Cardinals writers that are on that trip it's it's me Zach Silver and Derek Gould and maybe Jeff Jones we're the only ones in the press box still were like just witnessed something historic they'd never won 15 games in a row in their entire franchise history and I'm looking around and I'm like and it's at Wrigley Field so it's a little different right that's like one of the iconic ballparks and I was like all right well you want to be a beat writer so so this is it this is what it looks like I've slept in like six days I have no idea like when I'm gonna actually have my next day off this team is probably gonna go to the playoffs even though three weeks ago they looked like they weren't things escalated so quickly um but I think that's part of the, the best part of the job is you really can't predict anything so yeah. that was kind of like my surreal moment of like oh my gosh this, this is happening it's the middle of September you're no longer new at this like get it together you don't have an excuse right this story we, we've talked about a bunch of ballparks that we love uh on your first year on the beat obviously Wrigley's a great one and Bush Stadium is obviously fantastic what were some of your favorite ballparks as you uh on your first year I'd always wanted to go to PNC Park, um, so that was that was very cool to get to go to that road trip and sit in the press box. The view was was gorgeous. So that was a cool bucket list for me. Um, I loved Coors Field. Uh, I grew up in the West Coast as a Giants fan, so I always saw Coors Field on on my TV, and I just thought that looked like such a fun place to go to. But really, like the the most surprising stadium that I didn't think I would love as much as I did was Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City. I was like, this this place is amazing. Great concessions, great views. I love little water fountains. Uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that ballpark. I am so happy you said that because that's always been my most underrated ballpark. The it waterfalls, so it's so clean. It's so great. The fans are so awesome. And just watching a Royals game there is, is so much fun. So before we get into the 2021 and even 2022 Cardinals team, we just finished up our Hall of Fame ballot. And we both think Scott Rowland is a clear Hall of Famer. He's got a 70 war. He's got eight gold gloves. He's got over 2000 hits. He's got over 300 home runs and he's currently nearing the 75% threshold. I checked this morning and he's hovering around 73%. So he's right there. Oh, so what bad. do you, yeah. What do you think is keeping Scott Rowland off the ballot and would he be on yours? You know, I, it's funny. Cause I think there's so much hall of fame discourse because there's literally nothing else to talk exactly. about. <laughs> <laughs> I do think he's a hall of famer i'm not quite sure what's keeping him off um i think maybe the fact that i don't know there's so what i don't like about hall of fame voting is that there is like such different criteria like every which i is it's great right like when you have a such a big array of writers and and people and voters you're going to get different perspectives but there seems to be a lot of hypocrisy throughout the voting process i think voting for the hall of fame is a huge honor not something to be taken lightly but I think that we get so caught up as, as an industry, as fans on the discourse about it and the arguments over, you know, the steroid usage or the character clause and all of these things where Scott Rowland was never involved in any of those that we know of, right? Like, and there's a whistle. No, very, very like clean candidate. So it's surprising to me that he is not at 75% right now, but I, I think he will be. I mean, he's, he's pretty close. I don't know why every single person didn't vote for him. I, I really appreciate the writers that release their ballot and then an explanation why, because I think, you know, as long if you can explain and argue, that's great. Get some different perspectives, grows the game, creates a good conversation. Um, to me, he's a he's an absolute Hall of Famer. I'm sure he will get in, um, but it has been interesting to see him get left off for a couple different ballots. And I know you're a Bay Area person at heart. Uh, what is your opinion about the steroid guys in the Hall of Fame, including the big one, Barry Bonds? My argument, and this is a, an argument that a lot of people use, and you, there's certainly holes to, to poke in it, was that he was a for sure Hall of Famer before steroids clouded everything. Now, when you're talking about the PED era of, of baseball, my go, like if I was voting, I would say if you were not 
if you were never like publicly, like there was not public proof that you did it, there's suspicion, but you cannot like go on record and find out that this player did use them, was never suspended for them, was never, you know, guilty or however you want to term it, then I think it's safe to vote for. Um, however, that's such a different era of, of baseball. Sorry, my cat always. <laughs> She's dealing with her cat right now, if you guys are watching on YouTube. She's, oh, she's, oh, I never, never when I'm like bored by myself, she wants to be crazy. <laughs> always when I'm doing something. Um, but for me, it's, you know, if you were caught using steroids or you served a suspension, then I can see why you do not vote for these players. I think Barry Bonds' rep with the media, he wasn't the most friendly at the time, hurt him in the beginning. But now I, I feel like we're, I've seen him on a lot of ballots. I don't think he gets in, which I think is a travesty. Um, he absolutely should be. But for me, you know, if you were not convicted or, or proved, it was not proven that you use steroids, who are we to be the, the core of, of public opinion, really? You know, but I can certainly see both sides. I really do. Uh, if you're going to keep Pete Rose, because what I think what he did, betting against games is egregious too. You have, you can make the argument that if you use PDs, it was, you know, very clearly cheating. I see both sides and that's what makes the hall of fame discourse so controversial and so maddening sometimes is that there, there isn't no true argument, but I'll go on the record and say Barry Bonds for sure. Hall of Famer, no doubt. Um, but although I certainly understand why people would have their reservations. Well, and you're right. Like everybody's talking about right now, everybody's talking about the hall of fame thing right now, because we don't really have much else to do. And like Peter and I are sitting here talking about the hall of fame and then we're trying to do our best John Moselock impression too. Like, how <laughs> oh, are you filling the lockout right now? How am I feeling about it or just like, how are you feeling it? How are you filling your time? I would like to answer this question and being like, you know, healthy. I'm like going to the gym. I'm really taking care of myself. I'm really bored. Um, <laughs> it's funny because I was telling my friends, I'm always like living in extremes. It's either too much is going on or nothing at all. But I remember in September after like that whole madness of the winning streak, I was like, I would do anything for a day off. I just, just, I need a break. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to go back to work. <laughs> What do you mean there's no negotiations? Come on. Um, so, you know, it's been different. It's been uh, challenging to come up with storylines, but I did work in minor league baseball when they canceled the season and had to do the same thing. So at least I'm well rehearsed in this kind of scenario. Uh, but yeah, like, like mostly everyone else, I'm really hoping that we get some sort of negotiations or some sort of sample of hope that the season will start on time any day now, because mm -hmm. I would really like to, to go to Jupiter, Florida, where it's not snowing, like in St. Louis, and, you know, get a tan and, and do my job. That'd be fun. Yeah, that, that sucks that you're well-versed in this stuff. <laughs> a lot of people are well-versed in this stuff. Yes. Man. Um, hey, let's talk about the 2022 Cardinals, because the smoke okay. is going to clear at some point. Lockout's going to be over at some point. You're going to go to Jupiter. You're going to get your tan at some point. Oh, what, <laughs> what on this roster needs to be addressed before opening day? Starting pitching, uh, pitching in general. And I know that if, if you're the front office, you look back and you say, well, we got Steven Matz. And I, I think that's a great acquisition. I, I think when you look at the rotation, you look at Adam Wainwright. If you're doubting Adam Wainwright at this point, that's your fault. You should know better. Um, you look at Jack Flaherty. This guy has been poised for a breakout season for two years now. You know, he went so long up between starts in 2020 when COVID kind of just obliterated the Cardinals clubhouse 2021 he gets injured twice this is not a guy who has been injured a lot in his career I think he's really poised for that breakout season because when when he was healthy in the beginning of the 2021 season he looked like a very early Cy Young candidate he looked electric things were moving he looked like the Jack Flaherty that the Cardinals front office thought they were going to have all season and you have the rest of the rotation and Miles Michaels and Dakota Hudson both coming off injuries but both looked really good in September there's reason for optimism in those four guys but they needed more depth. They saw in 2021 what happened when they didn't have enough starting pitching. It cost them the division. And um, by getting Matt, you get that left-hander with that consistency, that ground ball rate that plays really well with the Cardinals defense. But you need more. I, I know the front office is very big on Jake Woodford, who's an up-and-coming young guy as like their swing man, as their spot starter, um, can also pitch long relief. He's very I, I like working with Jake because he's very easy to work with, and that is essentially how they use him. He's very easy to be used. But that's not enough. Six is not enough, especially in, in this day and age of, of how pitchers are used. Um, I, I really think they need to boost or more pitching more than they need to add a shortstop or add a bench bat or, or add a potential fourth outfielder. Because if they, they saw firsthand last year, what happened when there isn't enough starting pitching? It literally crumbled. I, they had the highest walk rate in baseball in the first half. Um, that's not really how the Cardinals prefer to operate. Um, you know, you had starting pitchers unable to get out of the second inning 
They had at one point three healthy starters and were just throwing relievers in on who was fresh. That's not a sustainable method. So I really think if I'm the front office, and this is to their credit what they have done so far before the lockout happened, it's look to keep adding to the pitching. And one move they did make um, that you mentioned as well, the Stephen Matt signing. Do you like the Stephen Matt signing? I mean, I can appreciate he's a sinker baller and it feels like an overall good fit with the Cardinals, but he struggled to stay on the field and a four-year deal felt like quite the commitment. I mean, they did get him at a solid price at $11 million per year, but I guess what was your reaction when you heard the Cardinals sign Stephen Matz? I wasn't necessarily surprised that uh, Matz had been identified to me very early on as the Cardinals' primary target. Um, and, you know, you looked at all the starting pitchers that were available and you thought, huh, Steve Matz, that's, that's an interesting guy to target. And it's no disrespect to him, of course, but what you look at his component and his, his build as a pitcher, left-hander, like I mentioned, they needed, they didn't have a left-handed starter, a sinker ball guy, gets the ground ball a lot. Um, can has You know, he hasn't pitched 200 innings once in his career, but has pitched over 160 in all four years, minus the 2020 shortened season, of course. So for the Cardinals, it's about stability and, and knowing what they can get from a pitcher. He had a great year with, uh, with Toronto last year. And I think that they believe that with the pairing of Yachty and with the defense behind them, again, this is five gold gloves, record setting defense behind Steven Matz, that he'll play well. Um, I don't think that it's the only move that they should make. I, I understand the signing. He very much fits what the Cardinals were looking for. They feel like they already have two ace pitchers in, in Jack Flaherty and Adam Wainwright. Um, and I think Matt really complements what the Cardinals are looking for. You look at this front office and historically over the last four or five years, their big offseason moves have not really come by free agent signings. I don't want to say that the front office is cheap because I don't think that's fair. I do think they prefer to operate very conserv- conservatively where they're not going to go out and spend these ludicrous contracts like we saw like the Rangers or the Mets do. They prefer to, you know, they'll spend the money if they need to on smaller incremental upgrades and their big splashes usually come via trade. That method has worked out relatively well for them. It certainly makes fans a little bit antsy, but when you look at the MO of this front office, that's pretty much what you can come to expect from them in the offseason. And my only reservation with the signing is, is the health. Because if, if he signed with another team that had this rotation that was healthy all year, but the reality of the situation was Adam Wainwright was the guy to throw 206 innings, but I'm certainly not going to doubt him, but he is entering his age 40 season. And then no other starter went over 100 innings besides KK Kim, who's now I think he won't be a Cardinal next year either, even though he's still a free agent. So that was my only reservation about the Steven Matt signing. But you're right. He is he is a solid pitcher. I'm just worried about the health of this starting rotation. No, and I think that's a very valid concern. And it's something that should be addressed because, you know, if you are going to rely on five pitchers, you need to have the confidence that they are going to be healthy. And you just can't have that no matter who the five pitchers are. I think if you have more starting pitching depth or some guys in the bullpen that can extend and spot start more like Jake Woodford-ish kind of players, then the mat signing is a little bit more easy to digest from a fan perspective. But you are completely right in saying, you know, what if he gets hurt? You know, he has a little, he has not pitched over 200 innings again in his career. You know, where's the longevity? That's why my my biggest thing, if I'm in the front office, shoes is, you know, how do we continue bolstering the pitching to alleviate some of those concerns? We're talking to Katie Wu, the Cardinals beat writer with The Athletic, and you mentioned that the Cardinals traditionally make their big splash via trade. Traditionally, they don't let their can't-miss guy go. But if the Cardinals were looking to win a World Series in 2022 or 2023, you might want to go get another frontline guy. So, like, when we were talking about the Cardinals earlier this week, we were looking at trade possibilities for frontline guys, whether it be a one, you know, you got to obviously shell out guys like Jordan Walker or something for a one or a two. We looked at some of the possibilities that were like Zach Plesak and Tyler Glass now. To do that, you probably have to part ways with a can't miss guy. That's like Jordan Walker, Nolan Gorman, Matthew Liberator. Have you heard anything to indicate that any of those three guys are off limits? Yes. Um, you look in at 2021 at the trade deadline when the Cardinals very clearly needed starting pitching. I mean, they needed starting pitching a month before the trade deadline and they still didn't get it because they rendered those three largely, you know, no matter how you slot it, those three are largely considered the top three prospects in the organization by pretty much every major publication. And in the Cardinals minds too, of course, those are untouchable. Um, they're, they're not going to part with Nolan Gorman who figures to be like the central DH, if there is one in the National League, um, you know, we never know, um, a central part of that 
of that core. Uh, Jordan Walker is the future. Um, they are. They love Jordan Walker. It's going to. I don't think they will part with him in any scenario. And and Libertor seems to be you know where they are relying on some some potential pitching depth. Um, and they certainly don't want to part with him either. So it's hard to negotiate a, a trade here because the Cardinals have long you know, blueprinted 2022 as their ideal season of contention for this reason. You know, they would, they're, they're prime young guys like Harrison Bader and Tyler O'Neill uh, and Dylan Carlson are, are going to be more, more matured in the game, have more experience. I mean, we saw the Septembers that Harrison Bader and Tyler O'Neill had certainly encouraging. Um, they have Nolan Arenado, they have Paul Goldschmidt, their pitching seems to be kind of lining up, but their prospects and their timeline was also matching up to 2022. So as much as I do think the Cardinals could afford to bolster starting pitching, uh, I think Chris Bassett, for example, would be a wonderful Cardinal. I I don't think they will part with any of the guys in the minor league system that would require that to get the deal done. You mentioned that the window is lining up, and you just mentioned two of the outfielders, Harrison Bader and Tyler O'Neill. You think in August of 2022, we're looking at Carlson in right, O'Neill in left, Bader in center, and then Newt Barr as the fourth outfielder as the best outfield in baseball? I think the most one of the more um, alluring outfields in baseball. Um, I really think Tyler O'Neill will emerge as, as an MVP candidate. Spoiler alert: that's, I have five predictions for the Cardinals coming out for the Athletic. That's one of them. Um, I, I think Tyler O'Neill um, that September was just a preview of the complete player he could be, and um, he continues to show continuous maturity as he plays. Harrison had a breakout year. Harrison's always been an elite defender. There has been no arguing that. And he, to his credit, really made the changes at the plate. You know, with, with Harrison, what he can do defensively and what he can do on the base paths with the speed, if he hits 250, you know, we don't, you don't need a power from Harrison Bader. You don't need him to be a cleanup hitter. You need him to hit around league average. And I, I think he can do that easily. And Dylan Carlson, I forget he's a rookie sometimes. Sometimes I forget that he's younger than me because he acts like way more mature than I do. Um, so, and, and Lars Newbar is just fun, right? Like, this is a guy that they called up because they had nobody else. All their outfielder call-ups just weren't staying. Everyone was hurt. He was like, okay, and comes in here and just becomes an instant fan favorite. He's, you know, very charismatic, very easy to root for. I think there will be a very fun outfield, a very good outfield. And I do think that fourth spot, I got a lot of, of questions, and they're good questions from Cardinals fans about who's the fourth outfielder. I really think it'll be Lars Newbar. Um, if he can show more continuous um, offense and, and continue growing with those guys, and him and Harrison are like best friends, um, I think that'll be really good for him. He's actually living with Ron Arnado this offseason. Um, about that. that. Yeah, that'll, that'll be good. That's, that's good for him. I think that'll be good. Hey, real quick on Lars Newtbar, his USC bio. I just got back into that. He listed his two favorite artists as Jack Johnson, which <laughs> is, you know, one end of the spectrum. And then the game, which is the other end of the spectrum. So he's got both of those. So if you're looking for anything to just dive into Lars Newbar, uh, I would recommend uh, asking him why that dynamic exists. That's He's very versatile, but that's very funny because I remember uh, at, we were in Milwaukee and he didn't know that Miranda Cosgrove, who he went to college with. Um, <laughs> yeah, weird. weird. This dude is very interesting. She had a song and I was like, how do you not know this is Miranda Cosgrove playing? And then Love Story by Taylor Swift, which literally every single person in this universe knows when you hear it, starts playing. And I was like, do you know this song? And he was like, Kelly Clarkson. And Dylan Carlson was like, it's Taylor Swift, dude. Like, and I was just like, how, how, are you, how do you not know? Everyone knows Love Story, dude. So maybe he's not as versatile as we think he is. I, I'm one of the worst pop culture people. I just, I'm so out of the loop on everything. So I usually give guys like that a pass. So I'm on his side. I, I would have had no idea. But oh, just, take, just taking a step back to the uh, Nolan Gorman uh, talk. I think the only reason that we thought he could be expendable just because the Cardinals have so many infielders, right? Including Jordan Walker. You know, you go around the diamond, Nolan Arenado, DeYoung, Edmund, Sosa, Goldschmidt. It just seemed like even though we think he'll be a good player, that they could package him for a starting pitcher. But it seems like Nolan Gorman really seems to be part of their plans for the future, right? Absolutely. And I, I think you're not wrong in the depth of the middle infield, but I, I think the, the targeted players that they could package for a trade, which I, I don't think that they trade for a starting pitcher this offseason. I do think that if it comes down to it around July when they're like, re, you know, looking at their team and then seeing how can they push to be a serious postseason threat, if a trade is necessary, they'll do it around the trade deadline. And I think that it will involve the package of a middle infielder, but I don't think it'll be Nolan Gorman. I think it'll either be Paul DeYoung or Nudo Sosa, mm. just depending on, on who's playing well. They're a 
Paul Dion has a very team friendly contract. He has a lot of power. Um, he's an above average defender, great clubhouse guy. He's an alluring guy with plenty of experience that teams would want. Sosa, kind of the, on the opposite side of the spectrum, has a lot of talent. He has a lot of spark. He's learning the game, but he sure is exciting and he's moldable. So, and also very team friendly deals. So I think either one of them, and, and I, I don't want to say, you know, just ship one off. I, I think the, the organization really values both. This front office really values Paul DeYoung and really believes in a bounce back season for him this year. But if that does happen or if it doesn't, I still think they'd be willing to package him up in a deal for whatever they decide they need at the, at the trade deadline because there is so much middle infield depth. And it's all good depth. It's not like you have some fringe guys. I mean, Tommy Edmond, gold glove winner, first year and not as a utility player, first year playing second base full time, wins a gold glove, unseats Colton Long, who he essentially replaced, right? Um, it, there's so much depth in the infield that I think they can afford to part with it, but it just won't be Nolan Gorman. So I know that Peter wants to get back to the pitching conversation in a minute, but I got to ask you this, you know, say the Cardinals get to the National League Division Series, game one, do you think the starting shortstop in game one of the NLDS is on the roster right now? Like on the active roster? Yeah. Like, do you think it's a DeYoung Sosa? I don't really. Yeah, I think so. I do. Um, it's one of the two, for sure. Um, I don't think you can go out and definitively say who is the opening day shortstop. I think it's very much a battle. Um, but I think it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have depth in your middle and field. I, I, we haven't seen a uh, new manager, Ali Marmol, manage, obviously, uh, except for a couple games when Shulk got ejected. Um, but he did say that he wants to incorporate more of a platoon and, and more of playing the matchup. So you will see, I think, more of a like shared responsibility in the shortstop. Um, but the thing about Paul DeYoung and Mendoza Sosa is they are completely different players, but their skill set is, is it's very expendable, right? Like, you know what you're going to have Paul DeYoung, you know what you're going to have in Mendoza Sosa, you play what you need from them. And I, I think that's ultimately a good problem to have if you are trying to configure a, a, a roster. So stepping back just to the, again, to the starting pitching conversation, um, I, we traded away some of the Cardinals prospects for pitchers, but let's say they don't do any of those trades. Let's scrap those. What's stopping them from signing someone like Carlos Rodon or you say Kikuchi with, I think they have $52 million. They're below the luxury tax. So they have money to spend. What would stop them from slotting either one of those guys in or possibly both considering they're talented starting pitchers who could immediately make an impact for the Cardinals in 2022. That's what I had trouble understanding because I was like, you know, it's not like they don't have the money. And I know that when you look at it, of course, like Nolan Arenado's contract, they're going to have to pay a little bit more in 2022 than they did in 2021. Um, and the biggest argument that I saw was, well, look at all this money coming off the books. Matt Carpenter's contract off the books. Uh, Carlos Martinez, Dexter Fowler's deferred contract off the books. But you look at their up and coming crop of talent and they largely consider guys like Jack Flaherty, like Harrison Bader, like Tyler O'Neill, um, like even Dakota Hudson to be the future of this team. We forget about Dakota Hudson because of his Tommy he's John good. surgery and like the 2020 shortened season. He's good. I was saying I liked him. He looks, I think he's good. Yeah, he looks really good in the, the limited yeah. time I saw him in September. Those guys are, are you know, largely regulated to as the core of, of the future. You know, when Adam Wayne right now and Molina retire, um, when they have to bring in a new wave. They're going to cost money to keep. They're all due for arbitration. They're all going to get significant raises. So the amount of money that they have to spend isn't as substantial as everyone may believe at first glance. I, I think the, the Cardinals front office is going to try to lock up as many of those players as they can as they reach kind of their, their peak performance levels. I mean, you got to remember these guys are, what, 26, 27? Like, they're, they're just now forming into the elite age for athletes. So... Maybe that could be the one thing deterring them. Um, but I, I do really agree that they need one more starter. Um, and it's like we said, it's better to have more than not enough. And if 2021 showed them anything when they very clearly did not have enough. Um, I remember specifically after Miles Michaelis got hurt after making one start, Jack gets hurt and the dude's never hurt. And KK is running down the bases and jams his back running first. This all happens in like a 10 day span. And the television cameras on, on Bally Sports Midwest pan to John Mosellock in his office. And he looks just dead inside. He's like, what am I supposed to do? And I just remember being like, you know, that's a feeling that I know he never wants to experience again when you're just running out of arms. So I've, I would 
hope, you know, I want to give the Cardinals the benefit of the doubt that when this lockout stops, hope cannot come soon enough, they will continue bolstering pitching because I, I do think that they would benefit from a guy like Carlos Rodon. It just depends on how much they're willing to pay for it. Absolutely. And someone we saw signed before the lockout that I saw multiple reports that Marcus Stroman was connected to the Cardinals, but he ultimately signed with the rival, the Cubs. Do you think it was a mistake not signing Stroman considering I think he was a fantastic fit for the Cardinals and that defense for his ability to just limit hard contact and keep the ball in the ballpark? Yeah, I I was surprised to not to not hear um, that the Cardinals were more not that they weren't interested. I think every team would be interested in Marcus Stroman if they were available. But to to hear that once they had Steven Matz, that was like their guy because no. Marcus Stroman has what the Cardinals needed. He has durability. He's like I can't remember the the exact number, but one of the most like in the last five years, the top five most durable pitchers. Um, he's a competitor. He surely like you said the hard hit the hard hit rate was a great point. I was surprised to not see them a little bit more involved in that chase, but it really, like, I, I really can't trust this enough. Steven Matz was the pitcher they wanted. Um, now, seeing Mark Stroman go to the Cubs, I know that Cardinals fans were a little upset about that, um, mainly that, and that, mainly because they wanted Stroman, but, like, also, as a Cardinals fan, you see a pitcher you wanted to go to your rival team that kind of doesn't sit well for you. Um, so I was a little bit surprised to see that they weren't more involved in, in conversations with Stroman. Okay, so, so Peter's going to throw out one more position player for you. Okay. Uh, and I gave him so much crap earlier this week because oh, let's do it. this let's guy's an enhancer uh, via trade. Pete, say it. All right. So it's not that big of a deal. It's it's a deal for a player that I think would be good. So this is Cardinals week on the Just Baseball show. We play general manager with this team. And I was made fun of by a lot of people at Just Baseball for saying Tony Kemp of the A's would be a great trade piece. He walked more than he struck out last year. He had a 127 WRC plus, and that's something that the Cardinals struggled with, with the walk rate. He can play the middle infield. He can play the outfield. Tony Kemp, thoughts? I don't hate it. Not the sexiest name. <laughs> but I, I like what Tony Kemp brings to the team. I like what Tony Kemp brings to a clubhouse. I don't necessarily know where he would fit in just looking at their roster now but of course I guess that's why you trade guys um I, I don't hate it I you thought this say was you hate it it's okay she I doesn't hate, hate it. it we did it I was ready to flame you Peter but I, I'm like oh, you know what? I can see it I, I, I'm not saying that he would be the starting second baseman. You got Tommy Edmond, but there has been some injuries around the outfield when we're talking about Harrison Bader we're talking about Dylan Carlson and Wright you know We'll see how the middle infield shakes out, but he can kind of move all over and he's proved that he can walk. The Cardinals, I think we're 24th in walk rate as an offense, just a guy who adds a different dimension and he's fun and he's cool. And he'd be, he'd be good in St. Louis. In my it's fun. I wouldn't, I personally, I think would enjoy covering him. Not, not that it's about me or anything, um, but yeah, I think it just goes down to, you know, the, the Cardinals like Tommy Edmonds so much. They have so many like Nolan Gorman is plays second base. That's going to, he's, he's going to be eventually be their second baseman of the future. Um, <laughs> it's like Pat again. So annoying. Um, I don't know where he would fit in, but if they could find a place for him, I think any team would benefit from having the, the charisma of a player that is Tony Kemp. There we go. And so another one. So on, on our episode, I also pointed to the bullpen and how there are so many guys still available on the free agency market, mm -hmm. um, especially with, um, with the back end of the Cardinals bullpen. It's a lot of young guys. I'm thinking they bring in some of these veterans like a Ryan Tapera or Brad Boxberger, who are some of the bullpen guys that you see on the block? Yeah, Brad Boxberger. I, coming over from Milwaukee, I feel like that'd be a great fit. I like Brad Boxberger. I've, I've heard some connection to Ryan Tapera. I like that. I, I've also heard there's been some interest in a Joe Kelly reunion, although I think he'd be a little bit pricey than what the Cardinals are, are looking to afford from a, from a reliever standpoint. Yeah. They have a lot of, of young talent, right? You look at Jordan Hicks, one of the hardest throwing pitchers in baseball. Um, Ryan Helsley was hurt, but Ryan Helsley, also a hard thrower, was a very uh, critical component to that bullpen early on. You have the, the three in Genesis Cabrera, Giovanni Gallegos, and Alex Reyes. If anyone's due for a, re for a redemption season, Alex Reyes. Um, which is so funny because nasty. like his, his early 2021, he was electric. Um, it's weird, weird times, but I do think they would benefit from a veteran guy. I think that's why they had the the need to bring back TJ McFarland. You know, that was both sides from McFarland side and from the Cardinals front office side. We're like, you know, there's no reason why we don't just get this done. So to bring him back on a, a one-year deal, I think brings some, some veteran presence there. They're going to lose Andrew Miller, who was a big veteran presence guy there. I, I think it wouldn't hurt to bring in someone like Joe Kelly or to bring in Ryan Tapera or even Brad Boxberger. 
um, just someone to kind of mold the bullpen together because it's very young. It's it has a lot of it has a high ceiling. It's a very high ceiling bullpen, right? Um, but you can always benefit from that maturity and that experience, and and that's what TJ McFarland brings. And I think they need one more guy like that that fits kind of McFarland's experience level to solidify the bullpen as a whole. So McFarland was one year for two and a half. Um, and you mentioned you lose that veteran presence in Andrew Miller, but getting that Miller money off the books was very good for them. Like he was getting paid a lot of money uh, to be money. a vet, <laughs> but a very average vet at that. So when you see the, the veteran arm on the market, if you had to throw out like an annual value number, like what do you think the Cardinals are willing to spend on a bullpen that already has numbers in it? I don't, that's a good question because um, I think they like Luis Garcia and what he signed for two years, 7 million with the Padres. So it makes me hesitant to think that they would fork over uh, any large amount of cash for Joe Kelly, who I think would, would be a reunion would be great for both sides. I really do. But I think he will cost a little bit more than what the Cardinals are thinking. So I'm not sure. I think it really just depends on how, you know, we didn't see a lot of the relief market before the lockout when we had like hot stove of the century. We didn't kind of see what they were going for, what these high names are going for, what teams are willing to pay. Like I said, the Cardinals are conservative in their spending, so they're not going to go out and spend a ton of money on relief pitching. I think it will depend on the market demand and their demand as they kind of reevaluate what they want their bullpen to look like. Um, but I, I can't see them forking over a large deal, no matter who it is, even if it is someone that would be... Um, as impressionable or for, for young guys as Joe Kelly would be. And we've talked about a lot of guys that have been connected to the Cardinals, but who's on your wish list? Like who's a free agent or maybe a trade piece that you see throughout the league that while, while covering on the beat for your first year that you were like, ah, God, I want that guy on the Cardinals. Um, you know, from a media perspective or like, am I going to be like a, a GM? Both. Like, yeah. Give me both. Give me okay. both. Um, from a GM perspective, I'm going back to this. I think Chris Bassett would be wonderful on the Cardinals. I yeah. think he has that tenacious energy, that like bulldog fight that's really respected. Um, you know, just to see what he did with the A's, to see how he carried himself after that grueling injury, to see his performance and his stuff. I think he's exactly the kind of pitcher that card the Cardinals front office would prototype. I just don't know if they'd be willing to uh, pull the trigger on a trade for him. If I am, you know, Cardinals present baseball operations which I would be horrible at. Um, <laughs> I would say like I, Chris Bass would be the guy that I would target and see if there was any way that Cardinals could finagle him from the, the A's who are once again recent or like, you know, rebuilding very sad, very sad for Oakland. Um, from a media perspective, I don't know. I actually really enjoyed working with John Lester um, because it's not someone that I ever imagined would have been on the Cardinals uh, when he got traded. I actually thought I was being punked. I was like, oh. Are you trying to like trick this like rookie reporter? I don't believe you. Um, but no, it was true. I don't know who else. Um, I've heard from my media friends in San Francisco, Brandon Bell is hilarious. And in a really like interesting interview, I've heard Tony Kemp is an interesting interview. I don't know. Um, Tony that's a Kemp. good question. Uh, Tony Kemp is that guy, I think. <laughs> he is. We have to understand, like from a media perspective, I... I will work with anyone, you know, that's part of my job is like, if you don't want to work with the media, that's fine. I'll try to make this like a, like as, as painless for you as possible. But I just enjoy people that are like fun to talk to, even if the things like never make it to print, you know, I mean like 80% of what things, what guys say to me, I can't print anyway. Cause I'm like, that is no way. There's no way I can say that. Um, I don't know. It's been, it's been fun to kind of just get to know the personalities in the game. Like TJ McFarland, just hilarious dude. Um, just, I don't know. I think from a media perspective, it's all about just, just people that are, are relatively easy to work with, but even if they're not easy to work with, you have to figure it out. That's yeah. kind of your job. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I do just have one more question about the Schilt firing um, that Mike Schilt, the manager for the Cardinals was let go and the quick turnaround hire of Ollie Marmel. Personally, I was a big fan of Schilt, um, but everything I've heard about Marmel seems really positive. As someone on the beat of the Cardinals, was it kind of bittersweet? Yes. Um, you know, you obviously you don't want to get too attached to, to these people because you do cover them, but you talk to the manager twice a day from like March through October, and it's hard to not get a, a sense of who they are as people. Um, it was surprising. Um, I, I think it's been pretty art articulated pretty well throughout multiple media outlets that no one saw this coming. Uh, I was actually prepared to write an extension story, not a Mike Schultz been fired. Um, but I really enjoyed working with Ollie in our limited capacity. He was 
just very fun, very down to earth. And I think he'd be a great manager. Um, I know that there's some trepidation from Cardinals fans because, and this is the front office's own fault, there wasn't a lot of clarity and, and a lot of um, transparency in why Mike Schultz was let go. Um, and to just kind of rush in and bring in Ollie, I understand that fans would be skeptical of this. But I think fans, and hopefully, you know, the media coverage can help them understand this, that Ollie has always been eyed by the front office as a potential manager. I'm not maybe just not the Cardinals, but anywhere in baseball. I mean, they, he was, they were essentially grooming him to be a manager. Um, was the timeline expedited a little bit more quickly than they would have, you know, preferred? Yes. But at the end of the day, Ollie was their number one target to take over when they decided to let Schilt go from the jump. It was just a matter of, you know, logistics and is this really what's best for the organization? One thing about John Mazalak is he doesn't do things without a plan. He always has a plan, even if he is not going to expand on it, even if it doesn't make any sense. He does not make like brash decisions without logic. So when Mike Schilt was fired, I think we kind of knew it was only a matter of time before Ollie took over. Um, 11 days turned out that was the magic number. Um, but I, I'm genuinely very excited to see what Ollie does. Um, he's well respected in the clubhouse, a young guy. And I think bringing in Skip Schumacher as his bench coach really helps kind of bridge the gap there. Katie, you got my brain turning. So one more for me, because you mentioned okay. that you were talking to Schilt twice a day for like six months. Yes. And as somebody that is interacting with like a college football or college basketball head coach on a, you know, per game basis, like three times in that day, how hard is the job of a manager or a head coach? No matter what happens, it could be the crappiest day at the office ever. And you still got to deal with like 20 people on a Zoom chat at the on end a Zoom of the day. Call. That's the worst part. I'm I, like, I give them their credit, you know, dealing with the media, especially in the Zoom era is, is very hard because anything you say can be clipped and grabbed and used on social out of context. So you have to be especially careful. Um, and like, I'm not like the easiest to deal with. I've been told I can actually be a little bit annoying. Very shocking. I never thought that. Um, Me too. But yeah, I mean, no matter what, you're you're talking to these these like this group of people who oftentimes are asking you to explain something. Um, and to Mike Schultz's credit, he was very good working with the media. You know, he was always like, if you need something explained or you didn't think I did a great job, like I'm more than happy to explain things to you a little bit more in depth. Um, there have been multiple press conferences where he felt like he didn't explain something or elaborate as well as he could have. So we'd start the next press conference off the next day with what he thought was a better explanation. And I appreciate that because it's really hard. Um, there, I, I don't know how ma I, more managers don't snap more often. I think it goes to show their patience, um, especially in the Zoom era. I give a lot of credit to, to any head coach that, that deals with Zoom. We don't like it. I know you don't like it. Um, but he, you know, to their credit, they, they do it because this, you know, we're professionals at the end of the day, we kind of have to figure out a way to do it. Um, but it is hard. Like, it's so weird. I would spend more time with the other beat writers in St. Louis and Mike Schultz than my own family. Like, I would know that Mike Schultz only shaves on Sundays because we see each other so often. Like, I, when is that information ever going to be relevant to my life? Never. But that's the kind of stuff that you learn about people because you see them every day. It's, it's a lot, but it's worth it. I really do think it's worth it. And listen, we all hate Zoom, but Katie Wu, thank you for doing this interview via Zoom. Of course. Hey, this is different. This is different. We're this all in different, different spots, and you guys are great. So thank no, you so no much, Katie. And what I think we figured out is that Tony Kemp and Brad Boxberger are going to lead the St. Louis Cardinals to a 2022 World Series ring. You know what? Um, I think if that happens, I'll just have to become like an official official sponsor of the Just Baseball podcast because we uh, very clearly should like buy a team if that happens. Boom. All right. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> thanks, thanks Katie. guys. Have a good one. Thank you so much, Katie. That was awesome. So much fun. You guys always are so like well prepared. It just doesn't even seem like an interview. It just seems like a conversation. It's we so just perfect. like this Thank stuff. You. you know. No, I'm I'm so nice. <laughs> well, if you guys are ever in St. Louis, just holler. Um, unfortunately, and we'll be there a lot. So perfect. And we'll have you on again. Uh, we'd love to have you on again before the season starts, maybe for a yeah. preview or something. Definitely. Yeah, that'd be fun. Anytime. Yeah. So and when awesome. you're at uh, when you're at Wrigley, holler. And we'll be uh, oh, we'll be I'll, around. I'll be there. I'll be sure I'll to say hey. Know, for sure. Perfect. Cool. See you guys. Thank Thanks. you, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Again. Phenomenal interview. Yeah, I mean, she's just great. Did you like what I was doing with the copy and paste in the doc? Because I was just like following no, her you, flow. Absolutely. No, no, I liked it. And I think there was just that one thing there because I, I just asked a bunch of questions in a row and I thought you were just going to kind of come in there. But yeah, I, I think if we could just like edit that, I don't know, whatever you, it doesn't matter. 
uh, before the manager thing. Yeah, just before the manager. I just, I, my, that was, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, I'll, I'll let it, like, I'll let it that little snafu. But I mean, yeah, I think that's probably the move going forward. Cause like, I feel like, um, I mean, that's something that, that I can do well just because I've been doing it for like, you know, six years. So like, I, I can follow the flow of where I think she's going with each thing. So like, that mats thing I bumped to the top as soon as yeah. she mentioned in passing that she liked the mats thing. So like that type of thing. So I can, I can easily I thought it was money. I was following along too. I almost like I do that. Um, and it's good that you were actually doing that, like copy and paste shit because it's like, I'll just, I'll read what she's saying and then find one of the questions that I thought, but I like it how you were like putting them in order so we could just flow and it was great. Right. So that was good. Fuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think we've got like, I think we're figuring out us two are starting to figure out Me the too. dynamic with a third. Yeah, absolutely. So that's good shit. All right. Quick outro. Quick outro. Okay. Three, two, one. She's right. It, it does just feel like we're having a conversation. Like this is not ask question. Here's answer. Ask question. Here's answer. Like, I wanted her so badly to give you shit about the Tony Kemp thing, but she didn't give you shit about the Tony Kemp thing. And you know why? It's because I'm just a little bit ahead of you, Jack. I'm a little bit ahead of Aram. I'm a little bit ahead of Colby. I'm just a visionary and you got to get used to it. Tony Kemp, Brad Boxberger. I should have a job in the Cardinals front office, but <laughs> I'm joking, of course. I, I'm just really excited for this Cardinals team moving forward in 2022 because you just... I feel like we just don't know what we're going to get. I, I think I know what we're going to get, and that's a good team and an exciting team. I almost feel like I don't. I think this team could be like crazy elite or not sign the starting pitcher. Maybe some guys get hurt, and we're looking at a team that goes under 500, or we're looking at a team that could win 90 to 95 games. I, I don't see just like, oh, this is an 85-win team, and there's not going to be much leeway. Okay, so number one. Big congrats on mobile sports betting being uh, legalized in New York State on Saturday. Remains not gambling advice, but yes. Yeah. Um, but number two, if you were to set a betting line on the Cardinals to win the NL Central right now, what is it? Oh, phenomenal question. I would... They're God, the favorite. I think they're the favorite. Like, are they so over the Brewers? The I mean, it's so contingent on what Yelich does because <laughs> if Yelich... Is 2018, 2019 Yelich, we have an incredible 100 win season. It's, I mean, this Brewers rotation combined with their bullpen, but they are going to lose Brad Boxberger, you know, <laughs> but we'll stay away from that for a second. Um, I, it, I, it all depends on what happens after this lockout because if the Cubs get Carlos Correa, that's something that we're going to have to pay attention to. I don't think that the Reds are going to be up there. I think the Brewers are going to be up there. I would say it's probably going to be close to a pick em between the Brewers and the Cardinals if you're asking me right now. But that question is going to be much more interesting when we get closer to the season. Yeah, there, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of divisions in baseball, I think in 2022, that are going to be this team or the field when you're looking at who's to win the division. The NL Central is one of the few where it's not really like that. Like in the NL West, I think it's Dodgers or the field because I have no idea if San Francisco can replicate what they did. But that, you know, that's like the heavy hitter in the field. Same with the Padres. If you look at the AL West, you know, you've got some parity there. But for the most part, it's going to be Astros or the field if Seattle takes a step up there. But like, you know, you've got St. Louis, who is looking good, maybe even really good, but not great. You've got Milwaukee, who's looking good, maybe really good, but not great. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Cincinnati, who looks good, maybe really good, but definitely mm -hmm. not great. So you've got... They look good right now. Cincinnati? They, they look good right now. I mean, I guess the definition Cincinnati, of good is... Yeah, I mean, they were a fringe wildcard team. Look at their team. I know you, yeah. we just went over the team. You, you, I, I, I'm, I'm more in the boat that I think the Cubs could actually somewhat overtake these Reds if they sign Carlos Correa. If they don't, I think we're having another discussion here. But, I mean, I, I just saw a lot of what I like with the Cubs, and I'm coming more around to it, and I'm, I'm slowly starting to back off from the Reds. I, that's just where I'm at right now. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I don't know, but we are putting the finishing touches on Cardinals week. I think we did a really good job with, with the cards. 
I, well, you, you and I have this weird love for the Cardinals. Like we, we just want to see them do well. And, you know, we're trying to be objective journalists. I am as objective as they come. I never talk to you guys about the Yankees. I'm always extremely objective. Oh, I forgot you were a Yankees fan. Yeah, you forgot. But I, I, I have found a love for the Cardinals because I just love the way they work. I love watching this defense go and it reminds me of old baseball. And I always, I always gravitate towards that, but I think we're ready for the announcement that next week is going to be Dodgers week. And I liked how you were saying with the, uh, with the giants, how it might be Dodgers of the field. The more I talk to some Dodgers people, the more I'm like, they got two starters right now without Clayton Kershaw. And then Tony Gonsolin is their third. And they're, are they going to rely on David price? I think the Dodgers have more problems than we think currently right now. And that's why it's going to be awesome to go through them. And and here's the thing. Dustin may is not slated for a return until like the all-star break. Exactly. Exactly. I I was under the assumption that he was actually going to come back sooner, but no, this, this timetable is prolonged for sure. Yeah. Dodgers week, obviously the money. We can spend more if we want. Who gives a (laughs) shit? We can spend all the money. We they don't care about the luxury tax. They'll they'll go a hundred million over. Let's break into the GDP, man. (laughs) Yeah. Let's contact the World Bank for the Dodgers. Um, okay, we have the article from the Athletic on Katie Wu recapping her first season of Major League Baseball in the episode description. We also have uh, the shirts where the proceeds go to benefit, um, you know, the tornadoes, the, the areas affected by the tornadoes in the Kentucky area and around the Midwest uh, in that vicinity as well. Um, what else? I'm glad, you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that because they're almost sold out. And on Sunday, we will be donating all of that money. So make sure to get your shirt in before the weekend, before they sell out. Um, and then we'll also be matching up to $500 um, of donations to the surrounding states down there and also i think i'm ready to announce this jack i'm starting another podcast people not gambling advice will be the name of the podcast i'm going to be hosting it with colby olson uh we're going to probably do two to three days a week so you'll see that come out soon it's not just going to be not gambling advice we're also going to be doing some fantasy baseball talk so i'm excited to do that as well um obviously the just baseball show is our baby we're going to be continuing to roll four to five days a week more baseball because we just we're not stopping it's too much fun yeah uh all right peter's cheating on me thank you everybody thank you everybody